Welcome back, Corporation students, to our next lesson in Stockholder Rights as we continue to discuss the duty of loyalty. This is our second lesson in a three-part series about the duty of loyalty. The first part, if you haven't watched it, please tune in to the video on DCIT's Director Conflict of Interest Transactions. Now we're going to move on to a little bit more of the nuance within that subject matter. As a reminder, where are we in our conversation? We're talking about stockholder rights in general. Stockholders have three main rights. They can vote, they can sue, they can sell, they can vote for new board members. Sometimes they can change their bylaws and give them more power. They vote for precatory proposals. They can also sue the directors for breaching fiduciary duties. And last but not least, they can sell their shares. And we're talking about that stockholder right to sue directors for breach of directors' fiduciary duties, in this case, the duty of loyalty. Directors have a duty of loyalty to their shareholders, and the breach of that can result in a lawsuit by shareholders or stockholders, as they're called in Delaware, against their corporate directors. Let's talk about how we are going to cleanse DCIT's or Director Conflict of Interest Transactions. Again, we already had one lesson on what is a Director Conflict of Interest Transaction, and we looked at the difference between the classic case. We looked at the California Corporations Code from way back when with Remilliard Brick. We looked at the Delaware General Corporation Law Section 144, and we talked about Benihana versus Benihana, Inc. to discuss Delaware's quasi-modern statute, and then the more modern but less widely adopted Model Business Corporations Act, subchapter F. We talked about that a little bit too. Now we're going to drill down a little bit and we're going to focus on Delaware as we talk about cleansing those DCITs so that they are neither void nor avoidable. Our first approach, as we have discussed in the last video, is getting disinterested director approval, but we didn't really focus on what that means. We understand that disinterested director approval is necessary, but what is a disinterested director? We're going to learn that in the case INRI Oracle Corp derivative litigation. One way that we can have disinterested director approval is by setting up a special litigation committee comprised entirely of, well, we hope, independent directors. One concern about those committees is that directors, they are all kind of part of one socioeconomic class. They know each other, they like each other, and it might be a structural bias issue. That came up in a big way in the Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia case. We're going to talk about that structural bias element. Up next, we're going to discuss Lewis v. Vogelstein. That case involved a shareholder challenge to an executive compensation plan. Of course, executive compensation, where directors pay themselves and their friends, creates a natural conflict of interest. So we're going to see that in Lewis v. Vogelstein. But the real reason we, we are going to look at that case is to see how shareholder approval or shareholder ratification can cleanse a DCIT. Last but not least, we have Harbor Finance Partners versus Hyzenga, which is another case about shareholder approval. In that case, the shareholders approved a transaction, but they claimed the approval was procured through a materially misleading proxy statement. So that will take us through some discussion about director approval and shareholder approval and then our last topic for today will be court-determined fairness. We don't necessarily want to go there because, eh, who wants to go into litigation if you can avoid it? But sometimes it has to be done, and if director and shareholder approval is not adequate, let's take a look at how courts will determine if a transaction is fair. And that's going to set us up nicely for a, a discussion in our third out of three videos on the duty of loyalty pertaining to the corporate opportunity doctrine. But for now, we have some work to do on learning how to cleanse a DCIT, so let's go ahead and get started. There are two major concepts, disinterested and independent. Sometimes courts conflate the concept, sometimes textbooks even conflate the concept. I'm going to break this apart into two separate concepts. First, we are going to talk about being interested or disinterested and whether a director has a disabling interest. Then we're going to talk about whether that director or is independent or, on the other hand, controlled, independent versus controlled. So those are really two separate points, whether the director is, one, not interested, disinterested, or has a disabling interest, or two, whether the director is independent or, on the other hand, controlled. So let's get started with disabling interest. When is a director not sufficiently disinterested? Well, there are two fundamental ways a director can be interested in a 
transaction. The first way is the director personally receives a financial benefit as a result of the challenged transaction. And that benefit is not shared with the other shareholders of the corporation. And finally, that benefit is of such material importance to the director that it is reasonable to consider that director's judgment clouded by the potential of getting this financial benefit. In other words, a disabling interest comes from a personal benefit. An agent might be expected not to be representing the principal's best interest when the agent can receive a personal benefit thereby. Sometimes this is framed more simply as saying the director stands on both sides of the transaction. When a director is both on the side of the buyer and the seller, stands to reason that they have an interest in the seller, even though they're a director of the buyer. Or to give you a more clear example, if a director is a venture capital investor and is on the board of a startup company, as a director of the startup, that startup wants to sell its equity for as much money as possible, to get as much money as it can for its equity percentage that it's selling. On the other hand, the investor wants to pay as little as possible, wants to get that equity for the cheapest possible price. So there's a clear conflict of interest in that case. Doesn't mean it's bad, doesn't mean it's wrong, doesn't mean it's a void or avoidable transaction, but it does present an issue with regard to whether that director can play a role in approving the transaction. Such a director has a potentially disabling interest. The second issue is whether the director lacks independence. Even if that director is not going to receive a personal financial benefit, that director could be controlled by someone who is. Control is a matter of being dominated by or beholden to another. Not necessarily about any personal benefit to the director. Again, the personal benefit to a director has to do with a disabling interest, whereas lack of independence has to do with being beholden to someone else who is going to get that benefit. To prove a director lacks independence, the plaintiff must show particularized facts, manifesting a direction of corporate conduct in such a way as to comport with the well wishes or interests of persons doing the controlling. Let's make it real simple. Disinterested means no personal financial benefit. Independent means not controlled by someone else. So a director is interested if they stand to make money off of this transaction that's not shared with the other shareholders. And a director is not independent if they are controlled by, meaning dominated by or beholden to another. Let's look at a case to see if we can clarify our understanding through analysis of an actual case in controversy. Let's look at INRI Oracle Corp derivative litigation. Oracle shareholders brought a derivative suit claiming company insiders knew that the December 2001 earnings report would fall short of expectations. So they sold their stock. That's called insider trading. We learned about insider trading later, so... Set that aside for now. Just know that it's bad. It's not allowed. The Oracle board created a special litigation committee to investigate the insider trading allegations. The committee, the SLC, the special litigation committee, was composed entirely of outside directors, none of whom were on the board at the time of the insider trading. They didn't get any fees for their participation. They did no business with Oracle. However, however, Two of the members of the SLC were eminent Stanford professors. Now, having worked with me for a little while, you obviously would think that all professors, such as myself, are beyond reproach and not subject to any sort of conflict of interest. But it's at least worth asking whether or not these eminent Stanford professors were in some way beholden to Oracle. What are the facts that might present that? Well, three members of the board had extremely strong ties to Stanford, including one board member who was a former professor of one of the SLC members, and Oracle contributed money to Stanford, providing a chaired professorship and other things. So again, there was a special litigation committee formed that is comprised entirely of outsiders, entirely of outside directors, people who do not have a financial interest in Oracle. And they waived any fees for being on the committee, and they didn't do any business with Oracle. But... Two of the members of the SLC were Stanford professors, and three of the 
interested board members had very strong ties to Stanford. So was this SLC entirely independent of defendants? No. No, the SLC was found by Vice Chancellor Leo E. Strine Jr. not to be independent. Vice Chancellor Strine suggested a distrust for the intertwined relationships between Oracle, Stanford, and the SLC committee members, and said these relationships could not be disregarded. Moreover, the SLC has the burden of persuasion that the members are independent, acting in good faith, and have a reasonable basis for the recommendation. Vice Chancellor Strine apparently believed there was a reasonable probability that two directors, these Stanford professors, were incapable of making a decision only with the best interest of the corporation in mind because of that corporation's role with Stanford. It did not go so far as to say this was because of structural bias, we're going to come to that in a minute, but simply because Oracle was so invested in Stanford, and so were these professors, that was enough to create a presumption of a lack of independence. Let's look at our next case, which is Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia versus Stewart. In this case, the plaintiff alleged that Martha Stewart breached her duties of loyalty and care by selling stock of another company, Imclone, and then making misleading statements to the media. However, the plaintiff argued that making a pre-suit demand on the board would be futile because basically a structural bias argument. The plaintiff argued that demand on the board was futile because of the social and business connections between Stewart and the other directors. That created a reasonable doubt as to their independence because they moved in the same social and business circles. The directors had a personal relationship and friendship with Stewart, and Stewart had 94% of the voting power. So, should pre-suit demand be excused as futile because of director interest and lack of independence? Is Delaware ready to adopt a structural bias theory? No. No, structural bias will not prevail, at least not yet. Demand is still required at this point. The plaintiff has to allege specific facts to demonstrate a lack of independence. Friendship and business relationships alone are not enough. Let's hear from the court, Chief Justice E. Norman Vesey. Allegations that Martha Stewart and the other directors moved in the same social circles, attended the same weddings, developed business relationships before joining the board, and described each other as friends, even when coupled with Stewart's 94% voting power, are insufficient, without more, to rebut the presumption of independence. This is not to say that personal friendship is always irrelevant to the independence calculus, but for pre-suit demand purposes... Friendship must be accompanied by substantially more in the nature of serious allegations that would lead to a reasonable doubt about the outside director's independence. To create a reasonable doubt about an outside director's independence, a plaintiff must plead facts that would support the inference that because of the nature of the relationship or additional circumstances other than the interested director's stock ownership or voting power, the non-interested director would be more willing to risk his or her reputation than the relationship with the interested director. Again, this is a rejection of the structural bias argument. Structural bias arguments are allegations that a lack of independent decision-making is because of a relationship of the parties. They're just not capable of making an independent decision because of the relationships. At this point, Delaware is not willing to accept that structural bias argument. But what gives? How come we're willing to accept what effectively is a structural bias argument in Oracle, but not in Martha Stewart? Well, the context of the cases is different. In the case of Martha Stewart, it's about demand excuse. The board is presumed to be independent when deciding whether or not to allow a litigation to proceed. A special litigation committee, on the other hand, does not enjoy the same level of presumption. The Special Litigation Committee has the burden of establishing its own independence. The fact that in Oracle we had a SLC versus in Martha Stewart we had a board decision, that is the distinction between the cases. We have a different standard applied to the two cases. 
On the one hand, the board has a presumption of independence thanks to the business judgment rule. On the other hand, the special litigation committee has a burden of establishing its own independence. Well, that was director approval, or SLC and director approval for that matter. What about stockholder approval? Stockholders, get together at a meeting, decide a transaction was fair. Is that going to be enough to insulate a DCIT from judicial review? Yes, if the shareholders had material information when they made their decision. And you may remember from our prior lesson, if the shareholders who approve the transaction are interested, the court may still scrutinize the transaction for fairness. Let's take a look at a shareholder approval followed by a shareholder stoot in the case of Lewis versus Vogelstein. A shareholder suit challenged a stock option compensation plan for the directors of Mattel Incorporated, which was approved, the plan was approved by the shareholders of the company at its annual shareholder meeting. There were two types of plans. The first plan granted 15,000 one-time options with an exercise price equal to that of the price on the market on the date granted, exercisable for up to 10 years. The second plan was for a grant of 5,000 annual options vesting over a four-year period with an exercise price equal to the market price. So, were you following all that at home? How much were these options worth? Do you know? Did the shareholders? The shareholders had some information, but they were not given the estimated present value of the options. The question then, was this a breach of the duty of loyalty? even though the shareholders approved it because they did not have enough information about the present value of the options to cure the DCIT. Again, what is the standard? The shareholder ratification is valid unless they had incomplete information, coercion, a majority of the affirming stockholders had a disabling conflict, or the transaction is waste Without getting into a ton of details about how to price stock options, I'll only say this. The shareholders actually did know what those options were worth. Since the option price equaled the market price, the option was at the money. For more on this, check out my videos on stock options. Without the argument that they had incomplete information, the only way to invalidate the ratification was claiming the transaction was waste. Waste is, well, it's a wasted argument. It never wins. Waste means the exchange of corporate assets for consideration so disproportionately small as to lie beyond the range at which a reasonable person might be willing to trade. In effect, a gift. Waste has to be ratified by unanimous vote of shareholders, and since you're asking them to give their money away for no good reason, or for very little consideration, they're unlikely to do so. But giving stock options to directors to try to retain them is not waste. If there's any substantial consideration received by the corporation and there's good faith judgment that in the circumstance the transaction is worthwhile, it's not waste. To incentivize management to act in the interest of shareholders by giving them stock options is not waste. And so this transaction was ratified. The shareholder vote cleansed the DCIT. Our last case is Harbor Finance Partners versus Hisenga. In this case, Republic Industries bought AutoNation Incorporated. A Republic shareholder argued the acquisition of AutoNation was self-interested because Republic directors owned a lot of AutoNation stock, and the AutoNation stock was expected to rise because of the acquisition. Moreover, that stockholder of Republic alleged that the terms of the transaction were unfair to Republic stockholders and the other public stockholders of Republic Incorporated. The purchase of AutoNation got shareholder approval by Republic, but the plaintiff shareholders alleged that the approval by the Republic shareholders of the transaction of Republic to buy AutoNation were procured through a materially misleading proxy statement and, moreover, constituted waste. 
Without getting into too much detail, I will tell you that the court determined, as a matter of fact, that the shareholder vote was informed, uncoerced, and made by disinterested shareholders, a majority of disinterested shares. The bigger issue, to the extent that this is an issue at all anymore, was whether or not there was waste. The waste claim was based that the declining price of Republic was because the transaction to buy AutoNation was throwing money away, giving money away, that AutoNation had effectively no value, and it was done only because the directors were going to profit from the increase in the stock that they owned. But it raises a fundamental question. Why would shareholders approve a transaction to throw their money away? No rational person would ratify a wasteful transaction by directors. The test of waste is whether any person of sound business judgment could view the transaction as fair. The idea that shareholders would ratify a wasteful transaction to which they are not benefiting assumes that stockholders as a class are irrational who rubber stamp even outrageous transactions. Chancellor Strine noted that the shareholders in Harbor Finance Partners versus Hyzenga were mostly disinterested, and the majority of disinterested approved the deal. On this basis, to determine waste, the court should only need to determine whether the shareholders were independent and informed, because why would they throw their money away? And how can you argue they were all coerced? Effectively, the waste argument in Delaware has been relegated to a question of procedural fairness. If the process is fair, waste will not be found in Delaware courts. Now that we've discussed disinterested director approval and stockholder approval, let's go where I was afraid to go. Court determined fairness. If we don't have disinterested director approval or stockholder approval, if we're not in the safe harbor, the court might have to determine if a transaction was fair. What does this entail? Well, the court will look at both the terms of the transaction and the benefit to the corporation, as well as the process of decision making. This is sometimes called entire fairness because it has both a procedural and a substantive component where we do not have disinterested director approval or shareholder approval. The court will look at several factors to determine whether there was procedural and substantive fairness. To determine procedural fairness, it'll look at how the transaction was approved, whether it was paper or process, board meetings, the disclosures that the decision makers relied upon, did they have the information they needed to make a decision, whether they were able to be objective, whether they were biased, interested, independent, and whether there was shareholder ratification and whether that was procured through an informed process. On the substantive side, we compare the fair market value of the transaction to the price the corporation actually paid. How do we know the fair market value of a transaction? It requires a huge amount of expert testimony and is inherently an art, not a science. We also look at the corporation's need for the transaction, if they were in desperate measures or if they were acting uh, uh, unnecessarily, and their ability to consummate the transaction to get to our substantive factors. Courts are not limited to only these factors. In fact, in Schlenksy versus South Parkway Building Corporation, the court looked at a number of other factors that were particular to that transaction. This only drives home the point that if the court is going to determine entire fairness, you're in for a long ride. As a result, the recommendation to corporate counsel is to try to get into a safe harbor. Under Delaware Section 144, that involves approval by disinterested and independent directors, or, barring that, by a majority of the minority of stockholders, disinterested stockholders who approve the transaction. Let's review. 
How can a corporation cleanse a director conflict of interest transaction? The first method is by approval by disinterested and perhaps independent directors. We saw the issue of lack of independence in INRI Oracle Corporation derivative litigation, although that did pertain to a special litigation committee. We saw the rejection of the structural bias argument in Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia, which can be distinguished from INRI Oracle Corporation because it involved a decision by the board and not a special litigation committee. Structural bias has still not really been approved by Delaware, but it's naive that it keeps kicking around. In Lewis v. Vogelstein, we started getting into the concept of shareholder approval, and we found that shareholder approval often cleanses a, a DCIT, even when there is allegations of waste. In fact, Harbor Finance Partners v. Hyzenga might have put the argument of waste into the rubbish bin. Finally, if we cannot approve the transaction through director or shareholder approval, the courts will determine fairness from an entire fairness perspective, looking at all the facts and circumstances to determine if the transaction is both procedurally and substantively fair. So that's cleansing director conflict of interest transactions. Thanks for joining me and tune in for our next video on the corporate opportunity doctrine.